Hello and welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. This podcast, we are going to listen to a podcast that was already posted on the Clean Power Hour with Tim Montague. And if you want to see all of the Clean Power Hour podcasts, you can go to cleanpowerhour.com or just search for Clean Power Hour. There's a lot of great podcasts there. It was pretty awesome to be interviewed not too long after Jigger Shaw of the Department of Energy was interviewed on this podcast. Check him out on episode 83 of the Clean Power Hour. Also, I'm honored that Tim Montague of the Clean Power Hour podcast took my NAPSEP PV technical sales course at HeatSpring. So if it's good enough for Tim, it's good enough for you. Some of the things that we did talk about during this podcast have to do with NABSEP, virtual power plants, vehicle to grid, some things about me, my books, the birth of the solar industry, how fast the solar industry is growing, how we just recently hit a terawatt of installed capacity worldwide, and all kinds of great stuff during this conversation. So if you want to learn more about solar, go to SolarShawn, that's SolarSean.com. And you can also check out a lot of great podcasts at cleanpowerhour.com. On with the show. If you went back, you know, to 2000, it, all a solar company was was two guys in a pickup truck, they said. And that was sales, design, installation, the whole thing. And now we're seeing these big companies and people are really specializing. And so what I specialize in is getting people NABCEP certified. That's what I'm mostly known for. And also getting people to take the NABCEP associate exam, which is formerly known as the NABCEP entry level exam. And so I go around, I go to places all over the world and I teach classes and my online classes, especially due to COVID, have really been taken off. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by the Clean Power Consulting Group. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Today, I have a very special guest on the Clean Power Hour. I'm very excited to bring you Sean White. Sean is the author of many books, including Solar Photovoltaic Basics, Solar PV Engineering and Installation, PV Technical Sales, which is my favorite, PV and the NEC, meaning the National Electric Code, Energy Storage Basics, and he's also a trainer. He gives live and recorded courses. He's very popular on HeatSpring. He's very popular on NABCEP. So if you're studying to be a NABCEP certified professional, you're going to run into this dude. Welcome to the show, Sean. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Tim. Yeah, thanks for having me on here, and thanks for the great introduction. Well, it is. it really is a treat to meet such a OG in the solar industry. So thank you for coming on the show and thank you for producing so many wonderful materials. I've taken, you know, one of your online courses. I, I've read your PV technical sales book and you are, yeah, you're just a fountain of good technical information on solar photovoltaics and now solar and storage. So just want to give you a big thank you for all that you do for our industry, because, you know, as we've talked about, Sean, it's so heady days. We're still at the bottom of the S, right? And we are about to just go vertical in the solar industry here in the U.S. and globally. We might have installed 1% of all the PV that we're going to install globally by 2050, say. And so we have seven doublings ahead of us globally. Here in the U.S., we're at maybe 4% of the grid is solar. That's going to at least 10x probably in the next 20 to 30 years. And so it is just going to be a wild ride. And we need a lot more qualified professionals across the board, from the trades to the boardroom, I like to say. We need more people getting into clean energy, and, and you are an integral part of that. How did you get interested in solar photovoltaics, Sean? I was always interested in renewable energy. And one of my best friends, I met him over at Governor Jerry Brown's house back when he, before he was mayor. His name's Paul Finn. And he came up with this law called Community Choice Aggregation, which now has been adopted in thousands of different places. And I was just going around with him, going to different events, watching him give speeches. We took on Pacific Gas and Electric in one. It was called a David and Goliath situation. And then I started doing some technical research for him. And I just really got into solar after that. And I, I studied and like crazy. That? that was right around the time when my older daughter was born. So I think, I guess you would say... 
26 years ago, 1995. Yeah. So you are, you are the early, the first wave of solar professionals really here in the U S I mean, the industry didn't really take off until 2010. Yeah. Even though the uh, technology, you know, was invented in 1954, the modern PV cell was invented at Bell Labs in 1954. So we've had, you know, 70 years almost of maturation. So the technology is mature. But as you know, you know, timing is everything and you could have the best technology in the world. But if the timing isn't right and the and the price isn't right, a technology will not catch fire, so to speak. And there is this thing called the the price adoption curve. As as you increase adoption, the price comes down. And that's played a major force in the solar industry. You know, when I was a kid in the 70s, solar was over $100 a watt. Yeah. And, and I was going to a renewable energy fair, you know, at the University of New Mexico, where my dad was a professor, but PV was hardly on the scene. You would see these tiny little, so, you know, PV panels, so to speak, right, that were used on remote telecommunications applications or pumping applications where there was no grid power. So did you get heavily into the off-grid solar industry? Because that was kind of the de rigueur, early adopting community of solar, right? Yeah. So I remember like setting up an off-grid system with my dad, even before then, you know, you know, so like even in like the early 90s, I don't know if you remember like Real Goods, the Solar Living oh, Institute. Yeah. And we had, you know, we still have that system going to some old Arco solar modules. And so, yeah, it was it was a lot of it was off grid. But, you know, if you're talking about if you're talking about community choice aggregation and all that, what my friend was into, that was actually, you know, more for grid tied solar for interactive inverters, feeding the grid with the string inverters. And so like, I guess I got involved with my friend around 1995, but still it was a while before it took some time to take off with that, you know, so the, the solar industry in the US and just kind of worldwide, you know, string inverters and all that kind of stuff seems like that was kind of really taken place around the year 2000. And if we look at the year 2000, they, that's when we had about one gigawatt of solar installed in the world. And it's kind of a big milestone right now. We've just thousand folded that. And this year, I, I just even read an article in PV Magazine that they say that we have hit a terawatt, so a thousand gigawatts. So that's kind of crazy. And like you say, that we're just going vertical right now. Pretty soon in a couple of years, we're going to be at two terawatts. So it's it's pretty awesome the amount of solar that's being installed and all the opportunities for people like you and me. Yeah, I think that article was written by John Weaver, my co-host here on the Clean Power Hour. So shout out to John and thank you for all of your journalism uh, at PV Magazine. So what should we talk about, Sean? You know, I really hope that we can give our listeners a glimpse into, you know, what it takes to become a solar professional. What are the resources out there? And what is the future of solar? I look forward to talking with you about, you know, building integrated agrivoltaics, some of the emerging trends that we see. But big picture, what are your thoughts about becoming a solar professional? Yeah, the, in this industry, like if you went back, you know, to 2000, all a solar company was was two guys in a pickup truck, they said, and that was sales, design, installation, the whole thing. And now we're seeing these big companies and people are really specializing. And so what I specialize in is getting people NABCEP certified. That's what I'm mostly known for. And also getting people to take the NABCEP associate exam, which is formerly known as the NABCEP entry level exam. And so I go around, I go to places all over the world and I teach classes and, and my online classes, especially due to COVID, have really been taken off. Some people say that I started COVID just so it would give me more business, you know, <laughs> but I try to make my classes as fun as possible. And I mess around like that a little bit, too. So, yeah, so there, there's just a lot of different things that people can specialize in. But I think that anybody in the solar industry should at least have the basic knowledge from the secretaries to the CEOs. And that would be somebody that would be studying for something like the associate exam, the NAPSEP PVA, the PV associate exam. And I've done a lot of classes, a lot of these different boot camps, preparing people for the associate exam. In fact, coming up pretty soon is going to be the NAPSEP conference. And so it's the continuing education conference. And I'm going to be teaching the associate class there again, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be down there in Phoenix. 
Yeah, I'm looking at the NABCEP website right now. That's NAB, N-A-B-C-E-P dot O-R-G, North American Board Certified Energy Professionals. That is the gold standard for certifications for the solar PV industry. And they have their annual CEU conference in Phoenix this year at the... The oh, Sheraton in Phoenix. Yep. Yeah. Do you know the and it's And it's, it's sold out and it's going to be start... It's going to be... Let's see. I have it on my calendar right here. It's going to be the 28th of March until the 31st. So that's going to be encompassing my birthday, everybody. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, and yeah, and, and it's actually, it's a lot of fun. We did the last one, I think it was in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it was it was kind of surprising how during COVID and everything, it's it seemed like they broke all records for all the amount of people that signed up for the conference. And so there, you know, it's just a good place to go and see all the professionals. The and it's and it naps up a lot of technical people too. So uh, maybe I should talk a little bit about some of the different certifications that they have. And yeah, why the don't gold, you? yeah, the gold standard one is the PV installation professional, and they have acronyms for all these things. And so it's called the PVIP, and that's the most difficult certification that they have. I used to be on the exam committee for the PVIP, so I helped them write some questions for that and some of the different material. It's been a while now since I was doing that, but I do know how they you know write all these different test questions. And by the way, too, all the exams for NABCEP now can be taken online. That's another COVID thing. So they call it LOP for live online proctoring, uh, another one of those TLAs, three-letter acronyms. But we have a little bit more, more in the way of lettering for all these different certifications. And so then there's the PVTS, the PV Technical Sales and that's the one that that's right up your alley right there. You, if you haven't taken it yet, you probably could go take it right oh, away. Oh, yeah. I have uh -huh. that certification. You, you have that one. That's great, Tim. Yep. And then, of course, I, I remember when they first came out with the PV Technical Sales, I think I might have been the first one to take it because I was all ready and I signed up. And as soon as that day became available, I, I took that exam. There's some specialist certifications that they came up with a few years ago. And they and one of them is the PVDS, the PV Design Specialist, the PV Installer Specialist, PVIS, and the PV Commissioning and Maintenance Specialist, PVCMS. And then they have a PV Inspector Certification. So they call that the PV System Inspector, PVSI. <laughs> So many acronyms. We're we're getting full of those. That's there'll be a test after this podcast, and and people can name the acronym, <laughs> pin the tail on the acronym, and all of the certifications that NABCEP has have they have some prerequisites such as experience requirements and things like that. Taking an OSHA class, except for the PV Inspector Specialist, PV System Inspector exam. And so that's just kind of interesting that there's no requirements for any anything. You just sign up for it and you can take it. And another thing, too, is the associate. A lot of people call that a certification, but it's not considered a certification by NABCEP. And so the PV associate, the PVA, is something that a lot of people qualify for that exam by taking my class. And then they go. And that one, it's a lot easier than the other ones, too. So people can, I've seen people study for a week that have, that don't know anything about electricity. They just know how to study and then they can pass that test. And by the way, too, my heat spring class where people pay money to take the class, they, I have a pass rate of 98% for the PV associate exam. Sometimes uh, when I teach classes live, that's why I say when, when people pay money to take the class, when I teach classes live, I'll have people that get paid to take my class, like through workforce development and things like that. And the pass rate there is not as much. It's like when you pay for something, you're serious about it. <laughs> but if somebody pays you to take a class to help you get a job, then people are a little bit less serious about studying, I think. So everybody yeah. out there too, study hard, no matter what you're doing. That's really important. Yeah. And look for Sean's guides. You can find... Uh, links to those on Sean's website at solar Sean S O L A R S E A N dot com, and your your books were instrumental for me to pass both the associates and the technical sales exam. So thank you. Oh, um, thanks so much. Yep, yeah. definitely, definitely. 
And it is, you know, it, it's not easy to become a, you know, a certified professional, so to speak. You have to get a combination of book smarts and on the job experience, right? It's both and. And that's, you know, as it should be, right? It's it's relevant. And you inevitably learn things on the job that you just are never going to learn in a book. You know, getting up onto a roof and, <laughs> you know, looking at an installation in the works is is truly a uh, super valuable experience. So I, I would encourage anybody getting into the industry to to get out there and and find a way to get hands on experience. Yeah, I always like to do a shout out for Grid Alternatives. You can find them at gridalternatives.org. And they are a nonprofit. They're sort of like Habitat for Humanity for Solar. And they're besides being just a lot of fun and great people to work with, you go out there and you can do an installation and get that experience and you don't even get paid for it. So that's a, <laughs> so that that's a that's a great thing. But it's like, you know, like Habitat for Humanity. And I think even one time Jimmy Carter showed up for one of these grid alternative jobs. I don't think he's still doing that, but you know. <laughs> since he's 150 years old. but <laughs> Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Clean Power Hour or viewing it on YouTube. We do have a great YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed, please go to cleanpower.group and hit that YouTube icon and subscribe to our channel. Of course, you can find all of our content on your favorite audio platform as well. So please give us a rating and review. I wanted to let you know that we are partnered with the Midwest Solar Expo this year. Check it out. MidwestSolarExpo.com. You can get a 15% discount with our code, which is CPH15. We will also put that in the show notes, CPH numeral 15. The Midwest Solar Expo is the premier B2B solar and clean energy event in the region. It hosts over 450 clean tech executives from around the country. And it's a lovely event in Minneapolis, June 20th to 22nd. So please check it out. Back to the show. So Sean, let's let's fast forward. You know, here we are in in 2022. The solar industry is is booming globally. It's not without its challenges, of course, with supply chain issues. COVID, of course, was was difficult to navigate. But, you know, one of the the most pressing matters that any solar company, whether that's an installer, a developer, a financier faces is finding qualified professionals, and that's only going to get worse. And it's both a challenge and an opportunity. It's it's a great opportunity for people who want a career change or are getting into a career for the first time. And and so if you just Google solar training or solar industry in your location and find your local solar association here in Illinois, it's ICEA, the Illinois Solar Energy Association. We have a national organization. Well, we have two national organizations, SEIA and ACES. And I don't know, Sean, if you have any words about about those two organizations. Yeah, so SEIA, Solar Energy Industry Association, they have always put on SPI, as we call it, in the industry. And I think a lot of us people that have been in the industry for a long time are still going to keep calling it SPI, even though they've rebranded it as RE+. Plus. I guess that would be Renewable Energy Plus. And one of the reasons that a lot of these organizations are rebranding things is because with all this solar on the grid, we need to have storage. And, and also we can include things like wind and electric vehicles and bi-directional electric vehicles. Those are some of the most exciting things out there. And so SIA also does a lot of the lobbying. And so they're you know partially responsible for that investment tax credit that we get that's so good for solar and everything. We do also have like for a long time, half the solar in the country has been in California. So we also probably want to mention CALSA, California Solar and Storage Association. And they used to be called CalSIA, and which is kind of funny is they weren't related to SIA at all, but they were called CalSIA. And so I also do National Electrical Code workshops at all of the SPI conferences, or now we're going to call them the RE Plus conferences. It's going to be coming up in September. I have my hotel room and everything all arranged, and that's going to be in Anaheim. And a couple of times, too, when we've been in Anaheim, we took over Disneyland. It was a lot of fun. I remember everybody was on the Pirates of the Caribbean and things like that, the whole solar industry. And so that's the, the one that's put on by SIA and some of the things that they do, they're, they're really good at lobbying. And then the other one that you mentioned was ACES. 
and I'm um, pretty involved with ASIS, American Solar Energy Society. And they are actually the first solar energy organization. In fact, I believe they were they came about somewhere around the same time they invented this. Bell Labs invented the solar cell, as you mentioned, 1954. Fortunately, I'm not old enough to know um, what happened exactly during that time. <laughs> so there's the International Solar Energy Society, and we call it ISIS. And um, they're the original ISIS, and they refuse to change their name just because of some crazy terrorists out there. But I do have an ISIS card, so when I do classes in um, different countries, I always bring that with me because if I get kidnapped, I figure it'll you know get me out of trouble there. And then I'm on the board of directors of NorCal Solar. In fact, I'm going to soon be president of NorCal Solar, and that's an ASIS division for Northern California. And so I've been pretty active with them for for quite a while. And so also ASIS has a lot of local chapters. And so wherever you are, anybody listen to this, join your local ASIS chapter. And then you can also, if you're in a different country too, you can get involved over there. I remember I signed up to be in the ISIS chapter in the Philippines when I was spending a lot of time uh, working over there. I've done a lot of work for their utility. They're called Moralco. It's kind of funny that the Philippines, they copy the National Electrical Code so good that they even have the temperature correction factor for voltage going down to 40 below zero. And the only place to get 40 below zero in the Philippines is probably being about 40,000 feet in the air. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's funny. Uh, Yeah, you mentioned ISIS, International Solar Energy Society. That's I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. We'll put all these links in the show notes. And then American Solar Energy Society, ASES.org. And then there's IRENA also, the uh, International Renewable Energy something something, right? Uh Association maybe. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking at my calendar right now too. And the ACES conference is going to be in New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I'm going to be there from the 21st to the 24th of June. My workshop is going to be on the 23rd. And then I was mentioning the dates for as I called it, SPI, but that's going to be the 19th is going to be my workshop in September, and it's going to go on to the 22nd. And there's also another conference that's getting kind of big. It's called InterSolar, um, and it was run by the Germans, and I've done a lot of InterSolar conferences in different places like India, Dubai, and Germany, teaching classes and things like that. And they always had InterSolar in San Francisco, but they sold it to a group in Maine, And they had a pretty good turnout in January, and their next one is going to be also in Long Beach, and that's going to be on the 14th of February through the 16th. And I'm going to be doing a National Electrical Code workshop there, too. And when I do my National Electrical Code workshops, I do them at the InterSolar Conference and at the SIA Conference, which is now RE+. I do them with my good friend and extremely smart person, Bill Brooks, who a lot of people have probably already heard of. Excellent. So many wonderful resources. And you can find links to all of these events that Sean is referencing also at Sean's website, solarshawn.com. Sean, you know, let's talk more about the industry, how it is maturing, where it is hot, where it is not. And this trend of solar plus storage, you know, we see how all the Many of the solar organizations are now rebranding and putting solar and storage like CALSA, California Solar and Storage Association. Why don't you just lay out for our listeners, why is storage so important and integral now to our industry? Yeah. So one of the funny things that I heard about, I think it was even about five years ago, is one of my friends, Marvin Hammond, was mentioning that storage is the new solar. So the way that solar just grew so fast from nothing to something. And it's kind of funny, too, that storage, you know, lead acid batteries are the history of solar. So they, that it's the beginning of solar. And then for a while there, it was just grid tight. So if you're only making you know, 1% of the energy that's going into the grid or less, you don't really need storage that much. You're just kind of shaving a little bit off the top and it's not a big deal. But then you can look at places where they've adopted a lot of solar. And so some examples of that would be Hawaii, Germany, and Australia, 
where uh, Hawaii has the most solar per capita of any place in the country. And so they get to these points where they're making so much solar. And if they're exporting to the grid while everybody's at work and their houses are the solar systems are going strong, then they might be making as much energy as the grid needs. And you need to still have some base load to keep it going, to keep things going. And so one of the things that they started doing in these places is stopping letting people export. And so they wouldn't let them export. And so we call this self-consumption in, in Hawaii, where, where what you do is you have a battery and you're not allowed to export. You measure the current so you're not ever exporting. They put a CT around, they call it. And so that, that's a current transformer around the lines coming from the utility by the meter. And so you prevent exporting and then you fill up your battery. And if your battery's not big enough or you're on vacation, you just have to curtail your system, turn it down a little bit. And so those are those self-consumption systems that we're, we're seeing in different places. And then as we get more and more solar in other places like California too, we're kind of heading more in that direction where we're getting more and more storage. And some of the storage, it could be at your house or it could be in one of these giant energy storage facilities. So the biggest one in the world right now, or at least the last time I looked, it changes all the time, is Moss Landing, California, where they have a huge energy storage system. They've converted a natural gas power plant over there to energy storage. And so that's been in the news. Some of the news is good. Some of the news is not so good when a battery cell catches on fire and it get, you know it catches some headlines. I think it does more damage to the reputation than it really actually does. And they're trying to be extra careful. I mean, if you think about it, you know, we're replacing things like fossil fuels, natural gas, and with our electric vehicles, gasoline, with lithium batteries, which are a lot less explosive than the fossil fuels. And so, and so the, I think that it's just getting really, really exciting as the lithium batteries are going down in price. And so I've been listening to some of your other podcasts. Actually, this morning, I was even looking at, and you had somebody talking about Swanson's Law, and that kind of applies to batteries too. So the more you make, the cheaper it gets. And even with solar too and batteries and all that, we do hear a lot about people that are afraid like, oh, we're going to run out of things. But I really think that we're not going to run out of things. There's just human ingenuity and, and different technologies, and there's lithium iron phosphate if cobalt becomes too much of a trick. And we're getting better and better at making these things. And they are even making Teslas with lithium iron phosphate batteries right now. And so one of the things is the cars are getting to that point where it's cheaper to have an electric car, especially after the events that we've seen over there in Ukraine. It's getting to be cheaper to have an electric car than it is to have a gasoline car. And a couple of years from now, it's going to be way cheaper to have an electric vehicle if they can make the batteries fast enough. And so we're seeing the biggest buildings in the world being these huge, giant lithium ion battery factories. And then we're going to have this huge demand for electricity. Maybe it's going to double, maybe it's going to triple to charge our cars. And so one of the things that we're going to have to have, I think it's just a no brainer, is we're going to have to have bi-directional electric vehicles that can support the grid. And it's going to happen just because there's the need and I think that there's going to be a whole lot of opportunity for people that can make the software. You know, the, the key word is AI for artificial intelligence, but just people that can make the software and figure out where to send the electricity to the battery, when to turn off an air conditioner for five minutes, when to make your car go towards the grid. And we're not talking about like your car battery being dead when you need to go to work in the morning. There's ways that we can program it so that doesn't happen. And a lot of times, too, it's just going to be we're going to need less than 5% of the capacity of that battery to make things work. And so I have an electric car, and I try to keep it between 80 and 20%. And usually, it's probably between 80 and 60%, just because, you know, that's just usually where it is. And it's and I've never had, you know, range anxiety unless, unless I forgot to plug it in or one time I went to the airport and, and there was no chargers and I was planning on filling up my battery. So that was that was not a good thing. But it's a, it's the best car that I ever have. I have a, a 2015, I bought it used, Model S, 85 kilowatt hour battery. And if you really look at the price of that battery in the car, it would have cost me more 
you know, for buying this used car than to buy 85 kilowatt hours of power walls to put on my wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of funny how the, and I've seen some other articles on this too, where people are running the numbers, how it's cheaper to actually buy the car and get some wheels with it or an equivalent price mm -hmm. than it is to, you know, buy something and stick it on your house. So it's, it's kind of funny. And so all of these electric vehicles, I think eventually are going to be able to support the grid. I bought my car from somebody that was working at Tesla and he was kind of higher up. And he told me, he's like, yeah, pretty much it's a software issue. It's like this car already can feed the grid. They just need to reprogram it. I'm glad you mentioned B2G, you know, vehicle to grid. I mean, there's many applications for batteries, as, as Sean has pointed out here. They can absorb extra energy from a solar array or a wind farm during the day when, whenever those resources are available and then be available for use at a later hour. And then for, for resiliency, you know, having a battery in your garage, whether that's a stationary storage, a power wall or similar product or an electric vehicle with a ginormous battery. You mentioned your car has an 85 kilowatt hour battery. That's several days worth of power for the average home in the U.S. And, you know, a, a, a standard power wall, I think, is 13 kilowatt hours. So you would have to have multiples of those in order to have as much energy as lives in your vehicle. The question is, can you get the proper hardware and, you know, the interconnection agreement with the AHJ and with the utility mm -hmm. to do this? And But you do see the news is starting to come out and, and the utilities are rolling out some pilot programs now in California. Ford has a partnership with Sunrun you know, with their, their Ford Lightning, which is going to come theoretically V2G ready. And I can't wait to see this really go live, so to speak. It's, it's truly a wonderful thing just for resiliency and peace of mind if you have the ability to plug your vehicle into your home and run some emergency loads, you know, the refrigeration, the lighting, the HVAC system, perhaps, if it's extreme weather or whatever. So that day is coming. And you mentioned that, you know, today if a small percentage of cars are electric, but it, the day is coming when all new cars are going to be electric because they're going to be more economical. We don't quite see that as consumers today, but it, it definitely is going to happen in the next five to 10 years. And, and then it's a, it's a cliff and the ICE engine is going to go bye-bye very quickly. And that's going to be challenging for the oil industry perhaps because a lot of the oil is used in internal combustion engines but it's it's a must do for society right because we have to stop pumping carbon into the atmosphere and we have to leave a lot of fossil fuels in the ground we love those things we want to save them for a rainy day and <laughs> and uh, and leverage the technology that we have that is now uh, you know mature and the most affordable. Let's talk about the economics of solar and solar plus storage, Sean, because that's really one of the driving factors now is that solar and wind are the cheapest new sources of, of power on the grid. And that's why the utilities and many other entities are adopting them into their plans, their their IRPs, where they're planning for the future of the grid. What What are your thoughts about solar economics? Yeah. And one of the things that it's like, you know, personally, I believe in, you know, climate change is a problem and all that. But it's kind of funny how many people in this industry are not in it for that at all. There's plenty of people in this industry that don't think that climate change is a real thing. It's kind of funny. I think about five years ago, there was a article that was out there that somebody did a study that they said four out of five people in California with solar were Republicans. And so it might have to do with, the, you know, that they live in more rural areas and all, all that kind of stuff. But people are buying electric vehicles and solar systems for financial reasons. And that's what's really making things take off. I have a friend that just bought an electric car and, you know, he watches all the different news stations that I don't watch. I don't want to try to get too political and things like that. It's kind of funny. Like one of the things that I've uh, seen in, in my classes is I've had classes that were just I had a class before with a bunch of journeyman electricians and they were coal rolling. You know, they put those things on their diesel pickup trucks and they make that big smoke and they leave a Prius in a cloud and all that kind of stuff. But you know what they're doing? They're installing solar and they're probably installing more solar than just about any person that 
you know, that's just installing solar in a house because they're doing utility scale jobs and things like that. So it's kind of amazing how things are transforming. And if you look at my car, it's the fastest accelerating car out there. I never have had anybody beat me at a stoplight. I'm not saying that I go over the speed limit, you know, but that acceleration is pretty quick. At least I haven't had a ticket recently. <laughs> and so it's it's so just nice. this technology, it's it's really neat. And it's going to take a lot of, you know, knowledge sending those electrons back and forth into all the right places. And I just can't say enough of how much that I think that EV to grid is going to be the the way of the future. And it's just, it's sort of like economically it has to be because there's going to be such a demand for electricity. The utilities are going to want it because they're not going to be able to give us electricity any other way. I've heard some people say that, you know, an electric car is equivalent of a house or, you know, as far as how much electricity it uses. But, you know, it depends on how far somebody commutes and people are commuting less these days. But that's a lot. That's just a lot of extra energy. And if we can just bounce those electrons in all the right directions and coordinate everything right, there's so many things that we can do with it. It's not just storing electricity for long periods of time. One of the biggest reasons for energy storage is called frequency regulation, so that they can inject extra power into the grid when the frequency slows down a little bit. And then do the opposite, too. If the frequency is too fast, they're a load. So if, like, let's say that you have a, a megawatt that's a measurement of power of an energy storage system. You could go from a megawatt exporting to a megawatt charging your battery. So that's actually a two megawatt difference. That's a pretty big deal if you can do that really quick. So one of the things that they'll do for, you know, to affect the power quality of the grid right now, or traditionally, is natural gas. And it takes a while for these things to ramp up and ramp down. They call that a ramp rate. And with the energy storage systems, they can ramp up and ramp down just really quick. There's lots of different energy storage technologies out there, too, besides lithium ion batteries. But I think that just like with silicon solar, they're the ones that are ramping up first. This, speaking of ramping. <laughs> with, and so that's why the price is just right for lithium ion batteries. Yeah, you did a good job addressing the value stack. So there is a stack of values that storage provides. It can provide resiliency, it can provide frequency regulation or grid services, and several other values. It's all geographically specific, so you have to know the local rules and regulations and find you know, a consultant, perhaps, who specializes in storage. A company called STEM is well known in the California market here in the Midwest. We prefer Intelligent Generation. Check them out, Intelligent Generation. And they're a uh, local Chicago company that really understands the storage market. And we have very generous incentives in Illinois now for storage, for stationary storage, Sean. We have $250 mm -hmm. per KWH. So the battery is cash positive in two years. And, you know, that is one of the barriers to entry is that storage adds cost to a solar project. Solar is not cheap. It is penciling in certain markets, wherever energy is expensive, first and foremost, that's why you see high penetration in California and Hawaii and some of the East Coast states like New York and Massachusetts and New Jersey, where power is expensive, solar energy is worth more, and you're going to get cash positive faster. Here in the Midwest, we have very cheap power, and so we use subsidies called SREC, Solar Renewable Energy Credits, to boost the value of solar energy, and then it pencils faster for consumers, and it's a win-win. We get to adopt more solar onto the grid, meet our renewable portfolio standard, create jobs, and reduce our load of pollution, both harmful pollution directly, you know, burning fossil fuels is bad for humans, <laughs> but then also slowing climate change, which is now becoming an existential threat as humans have kind of woken up in the last 10 years to that. Sean, in our last you know five minutes together, what else would you like to talk about? There's so many things, but what are you so excited about? I guess when you look into your crystal ball, what is coming in, in the solar and storage industries that, that people should be aware of? I think we did talk about the most exciting things because they're so exciting. And, and so that would be the growth of the industry. And that has a lot to do with prices going down. And so right now it's been a little, there's been a little bit of stagnation. And I think one of the reasons for that 
was what happened around the financial crisis. The so-called Great Recession of 2008 time or 2009 was that there was too much solar on the market. And so people were selling at a loss and a lot of companies went out of business because of that. And so now this time around, we're having the, you know, the COVID thing going on. I think what happened was a lot of the manufacturers said, okay, let's not make too much this time. And so now there's a little bit, we need more. And so then the, the price has not gone down as fast as I think it would have otherwise. And so I'm expecting the price for a solar system to probably go down because they're going to start, you know, you know production's going to be ramping up. It takes a while to you know, get these factories kicking. I'm always crossing my fingers and hoping that we can get some incentives for manufacturing in the United States, which I help, you know, is going to really help with energy security. And that's something that I'm hoping for. I don't know if politically that, you know, what's going to happen as far as that goes. But, uh, you know, I have my fingers crossed. And then also, like, as I was saying, too, things like uh, vehicle to grid and virtual power plants. And so a virtual power plant, otherwise known as the acronym VPP, they have a lot of these in Europe and things like that. And so they're coordinating together different assets like energy storage. And so when we're going to have virtual power plants, you're going to have like somebody that's your provider. It would be like a company and they negotiate with the utility and then they will import and export electricity from your assets. And so from your energy storage, from your car, from your photovoltaic system, and also be able to perhaps control loads and things like that. And so that's going to be complicated. I almost think it's going to be like the next Google or, you know, the, the big thing to, and I'm wondering where to put my money <laughs> if somebody can figure all this kind of stuff out. I was living in Mountain View for a couple of years, not, you know, I moved out for about a year ago and seeing all these people at Google. And they say like the average person at Google makes about 250 a year. But if you're only, if, but if you're in Mountain View and you say that, it's like, well, that's not enough. <laughs> but right. I think that there's going to be a ton of these jobs like that for people that know how to do the software, the coding, and understand all the renewables and the things that we're doing. So I think that's going to be some great opportunity for people. And just also, like we were saying too, how fast this industry is growing. And there's just going to be plenty of jobs for everybody. And so they call it the solar coaster. So you have to remember that it's going to go down a little bit, but it's going to go up a lot more, just depending on where you are and the political climate and what the utility is doing. There's always some battle, like we have the net metering battle in California for rooftop solar right now and in Florida. But it, yep, we it, know about the solar coaster here in the yeah, Midwest. Yep. Uh, it, it's definitely alive and well. And uh, luckily now we're booming again. It was a boom and a bust and now a boom. And we've tripled the resources going into the solar industry here in Illinois. So it is very heady days. I'm glad you mentioned VPPs, virtual power plants. You know, companies like Sunrun and Tesla are going hard after this. And it just makes so much sense, right, where you can get a lot of solar and battery into the infrastructure, whether it's third party owned or or locally owned by the residents. And then you have a, you know, collectively a resource that can be called upon to provide grid services, to provide resiliency. And I think, a re you know, eventually we will see the the evolution of microgrids and nanogrids so that they're widely, ex you know, widely adopted. It just makes so much sense to have like a city block or a suburban block be a microgrid and a resiliency center. And for every school and community center and church and hospital to be a resiliency center that has the ability to operate off-grid 24-7, 365, because as we've seen, nature is a beast and nature gets gnarly sometimes. And there are fires, there's floods, there's storms, et cetera. There's ice storms and very cold weather that creates outages and people suffer and people die. And so we have to be smart about this and modernize the grid and really integrate distributed generation. It's not without its foes and challenges, as you mentioned. The net metering fight that's going on in California is pretty amazing that even in this day and age, the utility has the gumption to push back so hard. I think that they are really, they're going to lose consumers and, and consumers are going to realize that there are alternatives 
to being grid tied. And that day is coming when it will be affordable and accessible to a much larger population to migrate off grid. And, you know, it is happening. Mm -hmm. So we're going to let our listeners know where they can find your contact information, Sean. I want to mention that we have a partnership with Midwest Solar Expo, June 20th to June 22nd. This is a well-known conference here in Minneapolis in the Midwest. And go to MidwestSolarExpo.com. We have a discount code here at Clean Power Hour. We'll put that in the show notes as well. It's a great place to network with solar financiers, solar developers, manufacturers, and solar installers. So the full spectrum of the industry. And then, of course, policy experts. So check it out, Midwest Solar Expo. You can find all of our content at the Clean Power Hour at our website, which is cleanpower.group. And then click on the podcast tab or click on the YouTube channel icon and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Those are the two most popular audio platforms for podcasts. And what that does is it helps other people find this content, plain and simple. This is, for all intents and purposes, a public service to the public to get more and better information about the solar storage, wind, and other clean energy resources. So please check out our content and give us a thumbs up. Sean White, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. Master trainer, NABCEP certified solar professional. And uh, you can find all of Sean's stuff at solarshawn.com. That's right. Yeah. All right. And, yeah, well, and if you. anybody wants to take my classes, just go to solarshawn.com. Find me. I have them online and you can get me in person, too. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Have a great day, everybody. I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar and storage. Let's grow. So I hope you enjoyed the reposting of the Clean Power Hour podcast as Tim Montague interviews me, Sean White. Thanks for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. To learn more about solar and everything to do with NABCEP certifications, go to SolarShawn, that's solarsean.com.